Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we are exploring the impact disabling hyperthreading has on Intel processors. And obviously we'll be doing this on models that actually support hyperthreading. Now I've done this in the past and I've done it because it's an interesting test. And that's partly why I'm remaking this video. However, another motivator is the fact that Intel's latest security vulnerability actually impacts hyperthreading. Tim's already talked about zombie load and similar microarchitectural data sampling vulnerabilities that affect Intel processors in his News Corner segment, so I'm not going to go over it in too much detail. Basically, there are four MDS attacks that affect Intel processors, and the most serious of which has been named zombie load. And just quickly, for those of you wondering, AMD processors are not impacted at all, so none of the four variants are a threat to those using AMD CPUs. So yeah, that is a relief for AMD, I would imagine, and especially those using their processors. As for Intel users, the only way to mitigate or at least minimize these vulnerabilities short term is to disable simultaneous multi-threading, or as Intel brands it, hyper-threading. As it stands, Microsoft is pushing out OS level updates to address the four MDS vulnerabilities, and you'll get those with this month's 1903 update. However, this doesn't mitigate the problem entirely. For that, we need new motherboard BIOS updates, and apparently Intel has released the updated microcode to motherboard partners, but so far, no new BIOS revisions have been released to the public, or at least at the time of making this video. So at this point in time, I can't test the real impact these updates will have for Intel processors. However, I believe we can test a worst case scenario by disabling hyperthreading, and for older platforms that may not get updated, this might end up being the only solution. So I've grabbed the Core i7-8700K along with the 7700K and I've tested them with a battery of gaming applications with and without hyperthreading enabled. I didn't bother testing the Core i9-9900K given that it is an 8 core part so the missing threads won't really be an issue here particularly for gaming performance though there will still be a negative impact on application performance and that really should fall in line with what we see from the 8700K and 7700K. If I was afforded a bit more time, I'm about to fly out for Computex and the testing for this video already took up a few days, but given more time, I would have liked to have tested some dual core hyperthreading enabled CPUs as well, as I suspect the impact there will be rather brutal, but I do have some old data that we can fall back on and have a look at later in the video. Anyway, getting on with it, all testing has been conducted this week using the Windows 10 build 1903, the Intel processors have been tested with DDR4 3200 memory, and the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti has been used to reduce GPU bottlenecks. Though the gaming benchmarks do take place at both 1080p and 1440p. But before we get to the game benchmarks, let's start with some application testing. Okay, so first we have some Cinebench R20 results, and looking at the Core i7-8700K, we see a 24% reduction in performance with hyperthreading disabled. Naturally, that kind of performance drop won't go unnoticed. Furthermore, in terms of performance, we're essentially turning the 8700K into a 7700K, so that's a fair old downgrade for those that would have bought an 8700K. Meanwhile, the 7700K becomes 26% slower with hyperthreading disabled, and now we have a plain old quad core or a Core i5 of that generation. So naturally for applications that heavily leverage all cores, disabling SMT or hyperthreading has a big impact on performance. Moving on to some testing with WinRAR, and here we see a massive 36% reduction in throughput for the 8700K. Clearly hyperthreading works really well for this type of workload. Likewise, we see a massive drop off for the 7700K as well, a 39% reduction in this case. So hyperthreading is very advantageous for this kind of processing. The second last application benchmark I'm going to look at is Corona, and here the 8700K saw a 31% performance decrease with hyperthreading disabled, while the 7700K saw a similar 33% drop off. Again, both were obviously significant performance decreases, so depending on how much these updates impact hyperthreading performance, we could see some pretty big performance drop offs in rendering and encoding workloads. Then finally, the last application we're going to look at is Blender, and like Cinebench R20, we're seeing around a 25% drop off for the 8700K with hyperthreading disabled. I say only 25% because we have seen up to a 36% decrease, but a 25% decrease is certainly nothing to take lightly. Then we have the 7700K with its fewer cores, and it does suffer a little more, and here we see a 29% performance reduction. 
Before we move on to gaming, I just wanted to quickly note some total system power consumption numbers. And granted, we're not looking at the individual processor consumption here, so it is hard to comment on efficiency, but you can see that the 8700K with hyper-threading disabled doesn't really save us that much power in this test. We're seeing just a 5% reduction in total system consumption. The 7700K was better leveraged with hyper-threading enabled, and here we saw an 11% reduction, which is probably more in line with the performance drop-off that we saw. Again, keep in mind, we are looking at total system power consumption. Anyway, time to move on to some gaming benchmarks, and first up we have the 1080p results for Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Here the 8700K only saw a 13% reduction for the average frame rate, and no change to the 1% low. The 7700K on the other hand, with its fewer cores, saw a massive reduction for both the average frame rate and 1% low result. Here we saw a 23% drop off for the average frame rate and 21% drop off for the 1% low. So those with quad core processors will be impacted significantly more by a reduction in hyper threading performance. Now, if you're primarily GPU bound, the 8700K does just fine without hyper threading enabled. And we see that here at 1440p, even with an RTX 2080 Ti. That said, the 7700K still suffers an 18% reduction in the average frame rate performance. So again, those with quad cores and God forbid a dual core, any reduction in hyper-threading efficiency is really going to sting. Battlefield 5 is a very CPU intensive title, though for this one we only had time to test the single player portion of the game, and even then we needed two origin accounts just to finish our testing because of that delightful hardware lockout. Anyway, keeping on the subject, we don't really see much of a performance decline here. The biggest drop off was up to 12%. We're looking at the 1% low margin for the 7700K. Increasing the resolution to 1440p didn't really help with the 1% low performance for the 7700K, and here we see in both instances disabling hyper-threading does reduce performance. Again, it's not major, but I doubt any gamers will welcome a 5-12% to reduction in performance. Oh wow, this is pretty brutal. Look at the performance drop off for the 7700K with hyper-threading disabled in the Division 2. That's similar to the reduction we saw when testing with WinRAR. So here the average frame rate is reduced by 37% and the 1% low result by 38%. Again, pretty brutal stuff. I'm sure there's a few Core i5 quad-core owners watching this thinking, hey, my PC plays the Division 2 quite well. And well, I bet it does. We're still seeing over 60 FPS at all times, but we're also seeing a massive reduction in performance with hyper-threading disabled. The performance impact for the 6-core 8700K isn't nearly as extreme, but even so, a 13% dip in 1% low performance won't be appreciated by most gamers. Moving to 1440p, and now with hyper-threading disabled, the 8700K isn't the performance limiting component, rather that would be the RTX 2080 Ti. However, we're still seeing a 32% reduction for the 7700K when looking at 1% low performance. Okay, so if you're looking at these results a little cross-eyed, then let me explain. Far Cry New Dawn is a title that plays much better on the 9700K than it does the 8700K, and the 9700K allows for around 120 FPS on average at 1080p. I bring this up because when we disable hyper-threading on the 8700K, it matches the 9700K in this test, despite having two less cores. So basically six cores and six threads is more efficient in this title than six cores with 12 threads, and we do see this quite a bit in games when testing SMT. That said, the 7700K with its fewer cores doesn't suffer the same issue with hyper-threading enabled, though it was still a smidgen faster with it disabled. So at least for this game, running without hyper-threading is pretty much a non-issue, and in fact it's likely going to be beneficial, though probably not if you have a dual core. Moving to 1440p and we see that the core count isn't an issue here, it's actually hyper-threading that's slowing down the 7700K and 8700K, and this is similar to what we saw at 1080p, though the effect seems to be more amplified here. Moving on, we have Hitman 2, and here we see that disabling hyper-threading has no real impact on performance for the 8700K. However, once again, we see the impact for the 7700K is quite devastating. The average frame rate dropped by 18%, but far worse than that was the massive, almost 30% reduction in 1% low performance. Granted, we're still seeing over 60 FPS at all times, but for those chasing big frame rates, this kind of performance hit is brutal. Even at 1440p, the 7700K is hit hard with hyper-threading disabled, as we're still seeing a 25% reduction in 1% low performance. Next up we have Rage 2, and here the 8700K saw almost no decline in performance with hyper-threading disabled. The 7700K on the other hand, here we see that although the average frame rate is virtually unchanged, the 1% low performance drops by 20%, so that's obviously a significant reduction. However, once we increase the resolution to 1440p, that is enough to remove the CPU as the performance limiting component, at least when looking at the hyper-threadingless 7700K. So here disabling hyper-threading has no impact on performance. 
We found in the past that Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a very demanding title, and we're getting a pretty clear reminder of that here. The 8700K saw a 10-12% to performance drop-off with hyper-threading disabled, while the 7700K saw a 24% drop-off, though the 1% low margins were similar to what we witnessed with the 8700K. In either case, disabling SMT does have a big impact on performance in this title. Even at 1440p, the effect is quite significant, at least for the 7700K. The 8700K still saw a small performance decline, but it was nothing like the 20% drop-off the 7700K suffered. Last up, we have some World War Z results using the low-level Vulkan API, and here we see the game runs just fine with four cores, so neither CPU suffers with hyper-threading disabled. That being the case, we naturally see a similar thing at 1440p. Both CPUs are able to extract the maximum performance from the RTX 2080 Ti. Okay, so we've now got a pretty good idea of how Intel's four and six core CPUs perform with hyper-threading enabled and then disabled. But to quickly summarize, for those of you who just skipped over the results, in core heavy applications, the performance reduction is typically anywhere from 25 to 35%. The impact on gaming performance does vary quite a bit, and this will depend on things such as the game used, that's probably important, but there are other factors such as the resolution, the quality settings, and then of course your hardware configuration, so your CPU and GPU, depending on what CPU you use and what GPU you use, you could be bottlenecked more so by one or the other. But I would say for today's games, the six core Intel parts, they're right on the edge. They, they for the most part, get away without hyper-threading uh, in today's games, but we did see instances where the 1% performance did suffer at times. So yeah, if you're chasing really high frame rates or a high refresh rate gamer, then the performance drop from losing hyper-threading on a six core part will certainly be noticed. Then for those of you with an eight core 16 thread part like the 9900K, the impact on gaming performance will be virtually non-existent. I haven't tested that in this video, but we have looked at that sort of thing in the past. And pretty much all games will run really well on an eight core processor. And we've seen that when comparing the 9700K and the 9900K in um, games previously. That said, application performance will see quite a noticeable drop even with the 9900K. That is assuming the application uses all eight cores quite heavily. And you should expect to see around a 25 to 35% performance drop with SMT support uh, disabled. But uh, yeah, again, that will depend on the application. Uh, and then of course, all of this is, well, it's a, it's much more impactful when you have a lower end CPU. So we showed how hyper-threading performs uh, with the 7700K when it's enabled and disabled, and this will be even more significant for dual core parts with hyper-threading, which are sort of right on the edge now. They're getting away. They're, they're, they're reasonable make-do solutions, but without hyper-threading, they're pretty unusable. For now, we don't know exactly how much of an impact the four MDS mitigations will have on performance, at least for these Windows-based applications and games. But we know there will be a performance hit, and we know it will be felt most where hyper-threading has the biggest impact. Pharonix has tested the mitigations on Linux, and the performance impact ranges from negligible to massive. Again, we don't yet know what the impact will be for Windows users, but we're confident there will be a reduction in performance of some sort, particularly in the scenarios just shown that saw substantial performance downgrades with hyper-threading disabled. Pharonix also found that Intel systems are now around 16% slower out of the box than they were before the Spectre, Meltdown, Foreshadow, and Zombie Load mitigations. Meanwhile, AMD has only seen a 3% performance drop. They also went on to say that the mitigation impact is enough to draw the Core i7 8700K much closer to the Ryzen 7 2700X and the Core i9 7980XE to the Threadripper 2990WX. Now, I'm sure there'll be some Intel fans that shrug their shoulders and say, who cares, the 9900K is still faster than the 2700X. And well, yeah, I, I guess that's fair enough, but you'd have to be happy with paying almost twice as much for a CPU that seems to continually become slower over time. Core i9-9900K owners aside, this is almost certainly going to be disastrous news for those using a dual core or quad core Intel CPU that supports hyperthreading. This includes all Core i3 processors from Clarkdale to KB Lake, Core i7s up to KB Lake, as well as KB Lake and Coffee Lake Pentium processors. Three years ago now, I looked at how the Core i3-6100 performed with and without hyper-threading, and the gaming performance results without hyper-threading were quite horrendous. In some titles, the CPU was choked so badly that performance dropped off by more than 50%.
The crazy thing is, three years ago, using a modest GPU of the time, the performance hit in almost all tested games was significant. Even gamers using a GTX 1050 Ti with ultra quality settings at 1080p were going to notice big performance drop offs. So any impact on hyperthreading's effectiveness for these CPUs is going to be bad news for anyone using them. I guess for those of you using older hardware, the best performance option is just to never update your BIOS again. Given the impact it's likely going to have on performance, it's probably worth the security risk. As I said at the beginning of the video, the BIOS updates that enable the mitigations on Windows 10 aren't yet available, so we can't test the true performance impact, but we can at least show you a worst case scenario. So uh, presumably it will end up somewhere in the middle there. This does put us in a bit of a pickle though, as I was just about to start updating all my CPU performance numbers. And I know other media outlets have started doing that in anticipation of Zen 2's release. So yeah, that's made things a little bit difficult because if I invest days upon days of updating all the numbers for the Intel processors and then these BIOS updates do come out during or after Computex, those numbers are pretty well invalid and I'd have to go do all the testing again, which I don't wanna do. So I've just put that on pause for now. I'll see what the deal is after Computex, and then hopefully by then we will have a, um, the new BIOS revisions with the updated micro code from Intel. Anyway, I thought it was interesting to see where hyperthreading makes the biggest difference on these processes. So hopefully you found the results interesting and yeah, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll actually be able to see what the impact of the MDS vulnerabilities is for Intel processors on Windows 10. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, please hit the like button. That'd be much appreciated. I uh, you can subscribe for more content. You guys know how that works, but hit the alarm bell because just hitting subscribe is kind of pointless these days. Uh, and you can support us on Patreon. You get access to our monthly live streams, our Discord chat and all that good stuff. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.